Don't know what's going on. John is the uh, Wizard of Oz behind the screen. This is the, the big thing, <laughs> trying to figure out why we're being kicked off. There's a bunch of you here. If I get kicked off again, don't go anywhere. We're going to figure it out because today's is just the best, the stinking best. Okay. Let me put this up. While we're waiting to make sure that this is all good, this, I had to laugh, we've got really bad weather in parts of the United States. I'm not sure about the whole world, but even here in Livermore, we were down to in the 20s. Yeah, cold. I don't think that's funny. <laughs> I think it's right on. <laughs> Are you think we're good, John? Okay, John thinks we're a-okay, a-okay, a-okay. All right, so as I wait for people to load on, I'm very thrilled with today's show, for lack of better words. Um, it's about uh, Sally Mavor, and uh, I got a really cool video that I'm going to try and have to figure out how to do that, too. I'm just feeling a little anxious right now. I didn't do an interview with her, per se, because... What is on her site is so beautiful, and I wouldn't be able to do justice to what she already has. So as an FYI, I got hold of her. I emailed her, and I think I shared this, I don't know, was today Monday? Yeah, last Wednesday. <laughs> and she said, yes, I could share it, and that would be great. So, all right, so what did I do yesterday? The kitchen, oh my gosh, we're on the home stretch. And John and I started cleaning. If you've ever redone your kitchen, it's just a classic mess everywhere. And then I said, this is insane because we still have to put up the molding on, on the top of the cupboards and on the side. So I'd started cutting out the drawer liners because my son said, do it now, now, because you'll never do it again and he's right. And so I started doing it. And then John and I said, this is just stupid because it's just going to get dirty again. So I was talking to Robin and she said, well, just go cut the liners. So yesterday I was, I cut the liners and labeled them. You can see it's labeled on the drawer, labeled on the liners. And lo and behold, I'm short two rolls. So I'm really glad that she'd got me off my rear end and got me going, okay? So I got a letter from Jake, and Jake has a little situation, and it's happened to me. It's about when quilts run. So, so she sent this picture of her, this holiday quilt, and I don't really see it on here. And my guess is it would have, the red would have been the bad boy, but no, it's actually the green. Um, you could see there it coming through on the star and on the inner border. So what do you do? Uh, I, this happened to a Christmas quilt, a girlfriend of mine, and I said, let me take it. And hers was a mess. So what I would like to suggest that you do, Jake, and I wrote it, I wrote you an answer, is get your hands on Centropal. We typically have it in the store, but we are sold out because of the holidays. We're getting more later this week. Every single quilter in the world should have this in their cupboards, just period. So next time you order from thequiltshow.com, throw this in. And remember, if you order over 100 bucks, you get free shipping. So toss this in. Also, for good measure, she had used Shout to prep the fabric. This is... Uh, this is your airbag. This is your seatbelt. <laughs> and it's funny, when I had a quilt that ran, I called Paula Reed and I said, okay, what do I do? What do I do? It was actually yellow hand eyes. And she said, this is what you do. She said, you put it in the washing machine. Now, my washing machine still has an agitator. And I think some of this comes H E and not H-E, I don't know, but she's, you read the instructions, but one of the things that it tells you to do that's scarier than all get out is that it tells you to do it in hot water. <laughs> hot water, are you kidding me? 
and then agitate it. And she'd say, as if you're not agitated enough. Well, no kidding. So, so it, it saved Debbie Stevens quilt or my quilt. It stayed, saved Debbie Stevens quilt who had a holiday quilt like this. Ricky was somewhere where the quilt was down on the ground. It was like a Baltimore album and it was in a show and there was flooding and it was like on the ground on a, you know, hanging and then coming this way on a sheet and then halfway up, it was just running, 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 running. It saved the day on that too. Now, again, you might have to do it a couple times. When my HE washer broke, high energy, it didn't have an agitator. So rather than get it fixed, I went down to the washing machine store and I said, do you have any with agitators? Because, well, I got a couple left. I mean, we're talking dinosaur stuff here, okay? And I got it. I love it. It's not H-E, but because it's just John and me here, we really don't have an extensive amount of laundry. I mean, if you have a family, then you got a whole nother thing going on. Okay, before I bring you Sally's beautiful um, video, I, I want to show you some of her work so that you have an appreciation of what you're gonna be in for, for your treat. Uh, when I asked her, she said, yeah, I got a lot of friends that are quilters. Mm -hmm. So look at her stash there. And there she's working on the book, My Bed. And the My Bed, Enchanting Ways to Fall Asleep Around the World. And you'll learn how she does it in this video. And so I'm kind of counting this as a teaching class or an enlightening, if nothing else. Now, was interesting, I went to her website. There's a ton on her website. I'm just showing you little sprinkles of what's in there. When she was a kid, I loved this. Uh, where did this doll-infested needle and thread universe come from? Became the height of the baby boom in a family of introverts who are either making things or staring into space. You could say we excelled at parallel play. Look at her on the left. But then the most miraculous thing happened is when she was in college, they let her keep working this way. And of course, the doll that she's um, holding right there is giant size compared to what she's doing now. But I think about for myself, uh, it was in college that they let me do my first quilt. And had I not been short that unit, I don't know. So I, I don't know if I'd be here today. I mean, I really don't. So it's one of those things where the an unexpected blessing happened in her life. Okay, so here is one of her pieces. I think of her as a children person, but... Okay, look at this. Look at the dimensionality of the birds. Oh, and the reason I'm doing this right now, too, is because we're going to be embarking on wool. And she uses a ton of wool, all right? Now, to give you an idea, because we really don't know how big this piece is, right? So I really appreciated that she had this. It's small. It is small. The birds of baby wood, BB Woods, very small. Okay, then here's another one that um, I love it. Summertime, harvest time, and oh, I don't have the talk. Frosty morning, mossy glen, summertime, harvest time. I have, or she has a close up of harvest time. The work here is just absolutely incredible. Incredible. Okay. Oh, and then I love this one. Um, this is Polly. And Polly is kind of like a uh, flat Stanley. Polly has a suitcase that always has her clothes in it. And then she travels the world and gets in really precarious little situations. Here, Polly's in Ireland, 2017. I love how Sally thinks. I love how Sally thinks. The, the playfulness of the whole thing. There. She's still in Ireland there. And look at, look at the little outfit and the skirt and the little face and, and all that good stuff. But Polly, oh, 
oh, wait a minute. She goes to Ireland. All right. I'm telling you, Sally, this is just amazing. But Polly, naughty, naughty Polly. <laughs> Naughty, naughty Polly. <laughs> now, being in the San Francisco Bay Area, I wish I had known when Polly was here. This is just, this is just imagination, like, like no other, right? Okay. So this is A Pocket Full of Posies, another one of her books, and it seems to me that a lot of her stuff now is geared towards illustration and things like that. Okay. Take a look at that button down at the bottom, the, the little flower and the little flower leaf. That gives you an idea of how small these are. Little, little, what was it? Little boy blue peep or little boy blue? I'm not saying much because I don't know what to say. I'm just so freaking impressed with her. The wise old owl. Okay, here's another pocket one. So, a <clears throat> pocket full of posies. What you need to know about Sally is that her installations are shown all over the world. And I have not been lucky enough to, to see any of them, but I believe on her website I was reading that she has uh, installations booked through 25, so you might want to check your area. But, but what I really want to concentrate on is, is this particular book that first caught my complete attention. Enchanting Ways to Fall Asleep Around the World. I'm trying to think where these different places are. I'm sorry. With a little teddy bear strewn to the side. Oh my gosh. Again, take a moment. Look at the thimble. Look at the scissors. Yarn. And it gives you an idea of the scale. Boy, she is somebody I'd love to have on the show. Okay, so now this is the one I believe that is showing through the 25. And this show, I'm pretty sure it's about this. So now I'm going to do the miraculous. I'm going to go over to my computer screen <laughs> and I'm going to find it. <laughs> and I will share with you this. I know it's going to take your breath away. My bed is like peeking into a cozy miniature world with characters, props, and scenery all stitched by hand. With utmost care, the renowned fiber artist Sally Mayfor has created a picture book that takes you on an international journey into the homes of children around the world. On each spread, she captures the spirit of a different place and a different way of life in intricate detail. These are no ordinary illustrations. Sally creates her pictures with fabric, beads, and thousands of stitches, creating artwork that brings these children to life while illuminating the universal theme of children sleeping safely in their beds. Let me show you what went into making my bed. Sally Mavor's artwork is indeed unique. She has spent decades experimenting with a needle and thread, developing ways of embroidering, wrapping, and binding different materials together to create a visual narrative. 
And it should be noted that every scene and every stitch of the book was done entirely by hand. So I asked Sally where her very unusual personal artistic expression came from. Even as a young child, drawing with crayons was never enough. I felt that my pictures were not finished until something real was added, either glued or stapled or sewn to the paper. So what I make today and how I do it comes from this same need to find my own way of translating what I imagine into something tangible to share. In the 1970s, when Sally was an illustration student at the Rhode Island School of Design, she was encouraged to find her own artistic voice outside the two-dimensional mediums common for most illustrators and to create work in three dimensions. With this kind of permission from her teachers, she felt free to access her younger self and rediscover the joy of making things with her hands. For me, it's all about the tactile experience. Holding and manipulating materials in my hands is where the magic happens. Sally Mavor has built a career in children's books with her own brand of miniature make-believe. Her desire has always been to make art that connects with people in an intimate way. A few years ago, an editor approached Sally about illustrating Rebecca Bond's manuscript for my bid, thinking that her artwork would be a good match. Because Sally's working methods are so labor-intensive, agreeing to illustrate a new book is a huge commitment. I asked Sally why this book made her say yes. When I read Rebecca's poem, I imagined scenes jam-packed with patterns and textures, all infused with a warm sense of home. What excited me most was the international aspect of the book. And then what? To begin, I studied lots of photos of children and houses and buildings and landscapes from different regions of the world. And using those as reference, I drew simple thumbnail sketches. Then I enlarged the drawings to full size and used those as guidelines for the finished artwork. Even before threading the first needle, I spent a lot of time going over in my head how to make all of the major parts so that they would come together in the end. All of the details and color choices came later as I started constructing the pieces. My favorite material is wool felt because it's sturdy and versatile and the cut edges don't fray. For this book, I also picked unusual fabrics such as a hundred year old age stained linen that was passed down from my grandmother it turned out to be the perfect texture for a Japanese tatami mat. Beads are great for adding a three-dimensional whimsical touch. With so many to choose from, the selection process was like an audition for bit parts in a play. Besides fabric and thread, I used a lot of wire. I've spent my whole life collecting interesting small treasures, from bits of wood to metal findings. When I see objects with special features that I think will convincingly replicate something in miniature scale, I put them aside and sometimes they make it into my artwork. I first got to know the children in the book when I painted their faces on wooden beads. As I continued to make their bodies and sew their clothing, I fell in love with them. Then it didn't matter how much time it took to bring them to life 
and create the places they call home. Time, yes, time. Each double page spread for my bed took Sally a month and a half to two months to create. After all, 18 scenes were completed, they were sent off to be photographed for reproduction in the book. At this point, the publisher's production team took over, overseeing the design, printing, and marketing of the book. Then, the pieces of artwork were returned to Sally to have their next life as an exhibition set to travel to museums across the country. I asked Sally why she thought making art for children's books was so important. Picture books are children's first introduction to art. And I want to give them something to connect with and care about. Grown-ups call attention to my techniques and perfect little stitches. But children respond directly to the emotional impact of the world I create with those little stitches. There is something for all of us to experience, young and old, as we travel the world through the pages of this remarkable book. What do you think? <laughs> right? Now, uh, Pat brought up that there's a book on how she does this. Uh, it's by C&T Publishing. I saw that too. I think it's called something like We Folk or something like that. But her work is just um, amazing. So go to her website and just um, do Sally Mavor, M-A-V-O-R, and it will tell you where things are being shown. Just extraordinary. So I talk about wool, and that's why I thought it was so perfect to show that. Now, I finally finished my gnomes. So one of you suggested I put buttons on the bottom, and I did. And the way we're going to do this pattern and this project, little buttons, is we're going to get together the, um, the wool for you. We're going to get together the threads for you, and then I'm going to encourage you to add things from your grandma's button box to it or Rick Rack box or lace. The other thing, it won't happen to you, but I had to piece things together on the back. So I pulled a Cindy Needham trick and that is just to put some sort of lace on top of it. And yes, you can see I quilted it. What am I working on now? <clears throat> yeah, I'm so glad you guys that she said yes. I am so glad. I'm working on this now. And I'm hoping that we can pattern this down the road. I've got a lot of work to do, but I just, I'm addicted. I don't know what to tell you. I am addicted to this wool work. Whew. Okay, so what is coming up on Wednesday? Well, Ricky's taking the helm. And i got to get the names here because I'm, I'm going to mess it up. Let me get my little thing from Ricky. Um, Jonathan and Beth Evans live in La Vida. And they're taking Batik to a whole nother level, to an art form. So he's going to do an interview with them. And I said, could you throw me some photos? Because when I saw these, I went, oh, man. And we're not talking like that you're going to cut them up. We're kind of talking like you guys have often asked about my Noah's Ark. I think it's kind of like a, a wax resist Batik. So let's take a look at this one. Kind of amazing. Kind of amazing. And then this one is simpler. Jonathan Evans, beautiful, beautiful. So Ricky will be here Wednesday presenting that, all right? Dee is still in the midst of a wedding. I'm so excited for her. Liana is such a beautiful, 
young young woman woman and actually if you go to the cover of my kids book if you happen to have it um she was in like a freshman in high school or something and on the cover of that book or she on, no she's not on the cover she's on the inside but now she's you know a teacher a woman beautiful so yay okay then monday let me see comments here yeah, and if you get the exhibit, if the chance, go to her exhibit. Her art is even more amazing close up. It's a mind blower. Um, Terry, we can purchase the kit as soon as we get it together. I'm hoping you guys are interested in doing this. I think it'll be a lot of fun. What I'm trying to do is keep... Okay, look, I blame it all on Sue Spargo. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm... She, she's my gateway drug. <laughs> love her stuff. What I'm, what I'm doing, like say with the mushroom one, is I'm trying to keep the stitches simpler so I can gateway you into the, to the world of handwork with wool and things like that. Okay. Uh, had to order this and cannot wait to share with my little friend. I know, I know. So next Monday, <clears throat> a while back, I was sitting at my machine and I go, I need to do a video on how to use the Bernina threader on my machine because I conquered it. And then I was going to throw it in as an extra today. And John said, why don't you just go through some of the features that you love on your machine? And, and I'm going to say probably if you're on a high-end machine of any sort, it will have a lot of these features. And you need to investigate if you have it or not have it. But uh, in fact, Sue Rapp, hi Sue, got hold of me and she has a 700 like mine. And she's looking for, to get a traveling one. She, her featherweight just doesn't cut the mustard. Once you get used to these bells and whistles, you're, you're a goner, all right? And she's looking at a 400 or a 500. And I said, write down the things that you love the most the things that you can't live without, and that's what happens, and then see which one is which, because of course the 500 is more expensive than the 400. So it, when you're into it, Sue, just, just get the one that's got the features you want. It is my understanding, I do not own a 500 Bernina series, that it's the closest to the 700, only it's got a, um, a smaller throat plate to it. Okay, Carol Barry, Barry she feeds my woolly addiction. Okay, let's just talk about Carol here for a minute. <laughs> she did color my world in um, all in wool. And this was the first quilt she's ever done. So yeah, it's pretty good. Um, okay. Okay. Oh, that's interesting, Arda. You love wool work. And when you do it, you have to wear gloves because I'm so allergic to it. But it doesn't stop me. That's right. So I will see you next Monday. And in the meantime, remember, Ricky's on Wednesday. I'll probably be watching too because I think the work is just astonishing. And then um, Dee is up to here in wedding. And then I'll see you Monday. I hope you guys have a terrific, terrific, terrific um, week. <laughs> what can I say? Bye-bye. <laughs>